alteration violations. In 2011, he joined the Office of Spill Prevention and Response as an Inland Pollution Coordinator for six Southern California counties. Lieutenant Horn has served both as state on-scene coordinator and investigator for numerous inland petroleum and deleterious material substances, as well as natural, I'm sorry, as well as cultural historical group leader in three incidences. So without further ado. Good afternoon. So when we rolled up to Refugio, we had no idea what a huge component of this response, cultural and historic, was going to encompass. Uh, practically every aspect of the response either coordinated directly or had review from the cultural and historical group. So as we move through, you're gonna see these little red asterisks on several of the bullet points. And rather than talking about the challenges at that point, I'm gonna group them all together into the end for one central challenge section. So as Yvonne mentioned, the Native American heritage of this area goes back 13,000 years to Santa Rosa Island off the channel where the creation story of the Chumash folks occurred. Um, at the time of European contact, there were approximately 150 village sites with a population of 20,000 Chumash. The red arrow shows exactly where the spill occurred. So we realized we had a very significant cultural resource issue, issue potentially building on this response. From a historical standpoint, also very significant in the Santa Barbara area, we moved from the Spanish to the Mexican to the American periods. So what is the difference between historical and cultural? With historical, we're talking about sites and artifacts associated with all human histories, not just Native American. Again, the 50 years or older is a general guideline. But really, when we're thinking historic, think archaeologists and think the scientific value of those given relationships and what they mean to the science of history. With cultural resources, we're certainly talking about the physical sites, the villages, the cemeteries, the artifacts, but we also have many much more intangible assets as well. We're talking about sacred ceremonial sites, landscapes, vistas, a view of Santa Rosa Island to the Chumash is a cultural resource because they're looking upon their place of creation. Um, hunting, fishing, gathering, economic locations, as well as plants and wildlife all fall under cultural resources. And if you've been following the news with the Standing Rock Sioux issue and the pipeline up in North Dakota, you can see that the Native Americans, um, the protection of cultural resources is not only very important, it's very emotional. And if they feel if the protection is not being done properly, it can become a very highly charged incident as well. So when we arrived at Refugio, the first thing we did was contact the Native American Heritage Commission for a list of the local, federally, and non-federally recognized tribes which had a cultural connection to the area. And that was what was unique to us, is we were also not just looking at the federal tribes, we were also bringing in the non-federally recognized tribes. So we contacted those listed tribes, and we invited them to come and participate in the response. We also reached out to the State Historic Preservation Office, advised them that we had some um, significant threats to cultural and historic resources and that we would be bringing on a historic property specialist list for um, section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act compliance. We then developed rate sheets and we set up contracts between the tribes and the archeologists. Some of them contracted directly with the RP and then we had um, others um, contracting directly with different response organizations. And then lastly, we had to evaluate the Haswapper status of the tribe and the archaeologist. And you can start seeing the asterisks appearing here. Um, the cultural historical group was in the planning section and under the environmental unit. I served as the cultural historic group leader as well as two other war uh, wildlife officers um, who would come in and give me some time off. At the high point, we had 50 Chumash cultural monitors and supervisors from five separate bands in the field on a daily basis. And then we had 11 archeologists, 10 in the field and one in the ICP serving as the historic property specialist. Um, that picture up top shows you the challenge we were against. That's the cobble and rock from Refugio. 
And most of the Kotor artifacts of the Chumash people were made from the native stone, the hand tools, the cooking rocks, um, the bowls. And so to an untrained eye, those artifacts looked identical to those stones on the beaches. Um, so what was most important for the cultural monitors was the field monitoring. They were walking the beaches, looking for these artifacts, making sure that they were not oiled or making sure that they were protected and cleaned if they were. We embedded a cultural monitor at a rate of about one to every 20 shoreline workers, and it was their job to monitor those workers and once again, make sure that any artifacts that were discovered or dug up during the cleanup operations were protected or preserved. And then for each of the five monitors, we had one archeologist in the field, and this was not a supervisory role, but this was merely for documentation for section 106 compliance. Um, the other thing that the cultural monitors, we embedded them with the shoreline um, cleanup assessment teams, the SCAT teams, whenever there was going to be any kind of physical disturbance, rock turning or digging, so we had a monitor working with the SCAT teams. The archaeologist's responsibility went a little beyond just the cultural side. Um, they also oversaw everything related to the historic resources. And this bottom picture, I find it really fascinating. That culvert right there is the culvert under the railroad tracks that the oil passed from the release point down to the ocean. Um, we were down there sandblasting it and scrubbing it with wire brushes when a transportation archaeologist came up and found the 1912 date stamp on it. And he determined this was a very important early example of the joint highway and railway connection during that period with the building of the Southern California coastline. He was very excited about it, and we were treating it like an old culvert. So it's just something to remember. It may not be what you think it is when you're looking at it. Lastly, we had an osteologist in the field. Um, any bones that were found, uh, fortunately we found no human remains. It was mostly sea mammals, but they had to be um, evaluated by the osteologist, because if we find any human remains, there are certain laws that kick in. A determination has to be made, are they archaic? or are they modern day? Because if it's modern day, um, we have to have coroner involvement, and it may be actually a crime scene. So this is the one area when bones are found on a response, we can actually stop work in that immediate area until determinations are made. Um, again, as I said, the archeologists were responsible for photographing and documenting all of the artifacts that were discovered, and they were compiled in the final section 106 compliance report. As far as the disposition of the artifacts, that was left up to the different Chumash monitors and the tribes. Most of them were actually either left in place or reburied, which was the preferred method. Uh, we found a couple of suspected grave goods that were considered very um, significant and spiritual, so those were actually taken out on a boat into the water. Ceremony was per uh, performed and they were dropped into the ocean. And then several hundred other artifacts that we're quite sure what to do with because they may have certain significance um, culturally or archeologically. They were actually conserved at the state park office for later disposition. The other responsibility of the cultural monitors was a nightly review of the shoreline treatment recommendations which came in from the SCAP team. Um, we had to look at these recommendations and set in mitigation methods to make sure that the treatments were allowed to go forward, but we were doing everything we could to actually protect the cultural resources. The other major thing is I showed you all those village sites, is we had village sites and ceremonies all over, or um, cemeteries all over the place. And as you're talking about accessing in several hundred workers and heavy equipment, we had to identify these locations, special thanks to GIS, <laughs> and um, set up entry routes so that we could minimize or prevent any damage. And these were not just cultural sites, these were significant archeological sites. Um, other duties of the cultural historic group leader, um, which was myself, as I said, at times, was to make sure that the cultural unit had their logistical needs. We had several tribal elder and dignitary visits. And um, one of the visits we had was actually Governor Brown's uh, tribal advisor, uh, Cynthia Gomez, and several members of the Native American Heritage Commission. And special thanks to Yvonne, she proved a great host on all of these tribal visits that came through. Um, I received several ceremony requests, and these were very difficult. There were people that wanted to go down and pray on the beach, and it was determined we could not allow citizens to go into the hot zone. So it was my job to work primarily with state parks to find suitable other ceremonial locations 
where we could give them at least another opportunity um, to perform their prayer services. Had to work with the PIOs. This was a very unique thing. The first concern was giving out too much information about cultural historical locations and sites because the concern is that once the response is over, too much information essentially becomes a roadmap for pot hunters to do. The second issue is the cultural traditions of many Native Americans. They do not like to have their photos taken. So we had to make sure that that was respected when the PIOs were doing press releases and taking photographs in the field. And then lastly, worked very closely with Cindy on the volunteer projects once again to provide um, proper access for the projects going in. Okay, I'm moving right along. Um, so we're gonna get to the challenges. Um, when we started this, we evaluated um, the cultural monitors and the archeologists coming in, and it was found that only a handful had any kind of HAZWAP or training. And I needed it, essentially 61 people in the field on a daily basis. So along with the volunteers and um, the industrial hygienists, we trained them in a four hour um, incident specific HAZCOM training, which was enough to at least get them out in the field and have them do the monitoring, but not the actual cleanup. Um, as I said, we put 100 um, monitors and 15 archaeologists through this training. So the next few challenges get a little difficult for me, and as I move ahead with this, there were times when the refugio incident was very challenging. Um, and it doesn't come so much from the groups or the individuals I was working with, but it comes from two factors. The first is working with a non-traditional response group that had never been on a response. Most of them had no idea what ICS even was, much less have ICS training. They had never exercised, they had never drilled. And then you add that to 13,000 years of cultural tradition, which has told them how to respect their culture and how to treat their culture. And here I am trying to merge the two together. And at times it became very messy. I would like to think I was the cultural group leader, but at times I had no idea what was going on out in the field. <laughs> because the cultural tradition for the monitor says that review of cultural items and decisions pertaining to that needs to go to tribal elders or tribal supervisors. And trying to get that information up the chain to me so I could brief my supervisors on what was going on was darn near impossible. By the end of the, excerpt, or the response, I would say we got to where I was probably getting about at least 50% of the information I needed, so we made some progress through the course of the response. Second major challenge was the shoreline treatment um, method reviews. Um, as we all know, when we review these shoreline treatment methods, we have to weigh the damage that's gonna be done to the environment versus the benefit of cleaning up the oil. Well, the same thing goes with the cultural resources. The reality is by doing cleanup and treatment out there, you are increasing the potential of damaging these resources. So when I sat down with the five band tribal supervisors on the first evening, we had three very small, um, shoreline treatment recommendations to go through, they looked at all three of them and denied them immediately. They said, we cannot do these, it will damage resources. And the archaeologists were on board with that too. So my challenge over the next five hours, for something that literally probably would have normally taken about 10 minutes, was to explain to them under the protocol for response is, well, we call these recommendations, we need to do these. The oil has to be picked up and it is our job to include a methodology with these treatment plans that will provide maximum protection for the resources, but make sure we're getting the work done. By the end of the response, we were whipping out 10 or 15 of these in 20 minutes. So it was just a learning curve that needed to be hurdled. And that again goes back to bringing in untraditional responders. And I'm not gonna go through this. Um, this was one of the major, probably the major challenge of dealing with it. Um, I was dealing with five separate Chumash bands that had, many of them had long-standing generational intertribal friction. Several of these bands had once been part of the same band and due to political reasons, they separated. So what I ultimately found myself with every night was sitting around the table with five different people who had five different opinions of how it should be done, five different ideas of what is a cultural resource and how should it be conserved, and it was my job to bring these five individuals together and try to form a coherent unit for operational maximum efficiency. And it, we had some long nights early on, very long nights, a lot of, I hate to say it, a lot of yelling um, and a lot of crying, but we got it done. 
I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Excellent. All right. <laughs> All right. So as she mentioned, we did an after action report and there were many recommendations for um, the cultural historical uh, group. Uh, I'm gonna talk about four of them here. And what happened with the recent Grove incident, um, I was fortunate enough to be allowed to go back up there and work as the cultural historic group leader. And it turned out I was actually working with two of the bands that I had worked with at Refugio. And the other unique opportunity was I was given the opportunity to try to put into effect some of the recommendations I had made in the after action report. So the two major successes is we finally got it down to a single Osro because dealing with the multiple bands early on, every band wanted to have a second separate Osro for their logistical needs. And by finally being able to get them all contracted with a single group, it made it so much easier for logistical support and payroll and things of that nature. The second major one was I was able to get rid of the midline cultural supervisors for the, shall we say, day-to-day -day operational decisions. When we needed to, say, move a work crew from Division A to Division B um, and move a monitor with them, it was completely given over to the Osro, which in this case was um, Patriot Environmental, and they were able to move those monitors. At Refugio, there was probably a three, three levels of supervision that that decision would have had to gone through, through the tribal, the tribal line of supervision. The work's in progress, and I don't really know where, um, I had two of the same issues that I had at the Refugio incident, and I don't know how these are ever gonna be completely mitigated. Um, it's gonna take a lot, of, a lot of thought, and each probably in each case, it's, it's gonna depend on the tribes that are brought to the response. But that cultural tradition, I never, seen I, I never see ICS in the future being able to completely take away that cultural requirement for elder and supervisor inclusion. The other issue is the intertribal friction. Um, I got called up to the uh, Valley Fire to coordinate for the debris removal up there at the end of last year, and I had one tribe to deal with, smooth as silk. So it's gonna come down to the area, what I have. Um, in some cases, maybe the neighboring tribes have a great relationship with each other. Maybe the Chumash of Santa Barbara was just a very unique arrangement, it's hard to say. But the parting evidence that I take from this, the most important thing that I learned on the Refugio incident came from a great elder named John of the Chew Match thing, and he said, no matter what you do, when you are here, stay out of intertribal politics. It will drive you down the rabbit hole. <laughs> and I will carry that with me through my career as I hope to continue with Osprey and the Cultural Historical Group work. Thank you. <laughs> So many uh, questions.